Hello everyone just Podcast TV is here please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified on new content. Episode 35. A new building. The courier walked straight to him. Hello, are you Mr. Tucker? James nodded. Yes. The courier handed him a package. This is your express delivery. Please sign for it. James signed the form without hesitation. He opened the package. There was a large envelope inside. Inside the envelope was a property deed. James was now the owner of all 32 floors of the Orion building. The package also included a summary of the lease contracts for each floor of the building. It was very detailed, listing the rent, the contract expiration date, and more for every floor. This is great, James said. He clenched his fist and began to read it closely. After a few minutes, he laughed out loud, because on this list, he saw that Prexness Pharmaceuticals' lease had expired half a year ago, and they were in arrears. James grinned. How interesting. I didn't expect this at all. There was also the number for the current director of the Orion building. James guessed that Scott would not have had time to call this person yet, so he did. Hello, is this Tom? Yes, who am I speaking to? The director's name was Thomas Marola. He didn't sound pleased that whoever this was on the other end of the line had called him by his first name. It had been almost five years since he had become the director of the Orion building. People there treated him with fawning respect. Even the bosses of the companies in the buildings were polite to him. After all, he was in charge of overseeing all of their rents. It was in their best interest to be on the good side of someone with that much power. That's why he was surprised and more than a little ticked off when this person called him by his first name, showing no respect whatsoever. James did not waste any time, he said in an assertive manner. Come to the lobby and you'll find out who you're speaking to. If you're late, don't bother coming to work tomorrow. Marola's tone had been very rude. If James didn't teach him a lesson right away, the guy would continue to think he ruled the roost around here. Marola was incredulous. Ever since he became director of the Orion building, no one had ever dared to talk to him like this. Who the hell do you think you are? My boss? Get lost. James didn't lose his temper. Instead, he responded with a cold, commanding hardness in his voice. My name is James Tucker. I'm in the lobby downstairs. I'll give you one minute to get your ass down here. If you're not here in front of me in one minute, the only one getting lost will be you. Before Thomas Marola could say anything, James hung up. Marola was furious when he heard the beeping on his phone speaker. He slammed the phone on the desk. Who is this guy? I've never heard of any James Tucker. Who does he think he is speaking to me like that? At least in the Orion building, no one had ever had the balls to speak to him like that. He was like the local emperor here. He stormed out of his office and headed for the lobby. The administrative office was on the ground floor, so it wasn't far from the lobby. In less than a minute, Marola was there, flanked by two security guards he brought with him. Marola looked around for the arrogant bastard who'd called him. He was around 45 years old, short and stout. The fat on his face was trembling with anger. James stood up and smiled pleasantly. He waved at Marola and his two goons and said simply, I'm James Tucker. So it's you, Marola shouted. He pointed at James. Throw him out, he ordered the security guards. They were both former New York City Police Department sergeants who knew how to deal with uppity people like this. As the guards approached, James took out the deed to the building, opened it leisurely, and showed it to them. He calmly said, Think about it, boys. Look at what this is. If you touch me, I'm afraid you'll regret it. Although the security guards did not understand what was written on the deed, they stopped and looked at Marola when they saw how confident James was acting. They'd been around long enough to recognize real authority when they saw it. Marola also read the situation, and a sliver of doubt crawled into his thick head. He walked forward and read the papers. In an instant, he saw the contents of the deed clearly. And when he saw that the owner of the property, a Mr. James Tucker... His heart skipped a beat. He instantly recalled that the entire Orion building had been purchased by a mysterious unnamed man. Thinking of this, 
Marola's legs went soft, and he felt a cold chill down his spine. Although James did not look like a rich person judging by his clothes, the deed in his hand was definitely real. Seeing the building director beginning to panic, James grinned and asked, Mr. Marola, do you understand the situation now? At this point, Marola knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. But something dawned on him. Tucker had just addressed him as Mr. Maybe he will spare me after all. Thomas Marola clutched the lapel of his jacket nervously and said with a trembling voice, Mr. Tucker, I am very sorry. I was wrong. James regarded him coldly and said, It's too late now. Pack your things and get out. You are no longer the director of the Orion Building. The two security guards watched the whole scene with rapt attention. They understood James's identity quicker than their boss had and were just as scared for their jobs. As the guards stood there not knowing what to do, James's words snapped them to attention. The two of you, get back to work. Why are you still standing here? They nodded their heads like a couple of chickens pecking at their feed. Yes, sir, they replied and quickly returned to their posts. By now, Marola had recovered from his panic. He walked a few steps forward and implored the new owner of the building. I was wrong. I know I was wrong. Please don't fire me. I have a wife and two young kids and I'm caring for my 80-year-old mother. At that moment, Scott Parker rushed in from outside. Upon seeing Thomas Marola begging for his job, his curiosity was piqued. Before Scott started working at Prexness Pharmaceutical, he was a security guard under Mr. Marola, so he was very familiar with him and his personality. The guy had been in charge of the Orion building for what seemed like forever. He had always conducted himself as a petty dictator, treating Scott and all the other building workers with everything from indifference to disdain. James, he asked, what's going on? Thomas Marola, on the other hand, didn't know that Scott was James's friend. He kept his focus entirely on James paying no attention to Scott. James just snorted. Huh, this sniveling guy? He used to work here. The word shocked Scott senseless. He had never seen anyone talk to Thomas Marola like that. What was happening here? Episode 36, The Rent. Scott stood there blinking his eyes in disbelief. He couldn't believe James dared to talk to Thomas Marola like that. He knew his friend had won the lottery, but still, he shouldn't be so arrogant to someone as important as Marola. He knew the building director's character well. In the past, if anyone were to ever address Marola like that, he would have had the security guards kick them to the curb. Yet he didn't make a peep despite being disparaged so brutally. Scott was confused when Mr. Marola turned to him. Scott, I'm begging you. Tell the boss not to fire me. We used to be colleagues, remember? Marola did not expect Scott to be good friends with James. He felt that he had found a new lifeline to keep his job. Scott just stared at Marola. Boss? You're calling James your boss? What's going on? He turned around and shot James a puzzled look. He was completely confused. James patted Scott's shoulder and said, Brother, I told you I would bring you along to make a fortune. The Orion building is mine now. Don't ask unnecessary questions. From now on, you are the administrator of the building. The management office is yours. Scott just chuckled. He didn't believe a word James had said. Ah, my old friend, don't bullshit me. It's not funny. I know you won the lottery, but this building is worth a lot more than that. It can't be all yours, right? James didn't waste any words. See for yourself. He passed the property deed to Scott. Scott scanned the document, then looked at the wretched Mr. Marola. He had no choice but to believe it now. He burst into laughter. <laughs> James, damn it, this is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Scott quickly collected himself. Fortunately, most people were at work, so there weren't many onlookers in the lobby. Otherwise, he would have been seen as a lunatic. Scott's heart was riddled with doubt, but he had a strange feeling to put complete faith in James. Well then, he said, this time more quietly, where should we start? Scott was a young man who had worked for other people his entire life. Now that he knew everything that was happening was real, he suddenly felt like he was the master. 
It was yet another strange feeling. James laughed and handed the list of building tenants to his friend. There's no rush. Take a look at this first and you'll know exactly where we should start. Scott read through the document quickly in less than five seconds. He saw the details of Prexness Pharmaceutical. Those guys owed half a year's rent. He looked at James and they grinned at the same time. Obviously, the two of them had thought of the same thing. Do you understand now? James asked. Scott's smile turned slightly sinister. James, my friend, of course I understand. The two of them chatted and laughed as they walked towards the elevator. They were going to find the head of Prexness Pharmaceutical, Peter Evans, to collect the back rent. As for Tom Marola, he was completely ignored. But when he saw the two of them leaving, he immediately pleaded with Scott to help on his behalf. Scott, I beg you, please put in a word for me. I need this job. Scott was a kind person. Although he did not know what had happened between Mr. Marola and James before he'd arrived, his heart softened. After a moment of hesitation, he looked at James and said, Why don't you give him another chance? James remained firm. No chance, he said curtly. When he heard James's words, Marola started crying like a child. He was a grown man in his 40s. It was a pitiful display. Scott began to walk away, but he couldn't take it anymore. This time he tried a different approach with James. You know I don't know how to manage an entire building yet. I'll vouch for him. Give him another chance. James was in no hurry to reply. Instead, he pretended to be deep in thought. In his heart, however, he was amused by Scott's kindness. In fact, from the beginning, he had never intended to fire Tom Marola. Although the man was arrogant as all hell, he had run the building for a long time and knew it like the back of his hand. James knew he couldn't just fire such a useful person. However, he had to yank the reins hard on this guy's personality. Otherwise, he would never be able to control him in the future. He also knew that Scott needed someone to help him. He really did not know anything about management and no one was more suitable to a system than Marola. James knew exactly how to play this hand. If he simply demoted Marola to assistant director and asked him to help Scott, Marola would never have accepted it. He would secretly resent Scott and scheme to replace him in the future. But now, when James was determined to fire him, Scott had pleaded for him twice. Because Scott helped him keep his job, Marola would now be grateful to him and be willing to assist in any way possible. He knew the consequences if he did not. This was James's game. When managing people, one had to rely on all kinds of schemes and strategies. Otherwise, it could be very difficult to achieve the results you wanted. Marola stared at James nervously. It was as if he were at the gallows and waiting for the king's verdict. He did not expect to retain his director position. That much he knew. But as long as James could show mercy and let him stay, he would be satisfied and immensely grateful. James stared at him for a long five seconds. He seemed to have thought it through in his mind before he said slowly, Since Scott is vouching for you, you can stay. Marola heaved a sigh of relief. Really? Thank you, sir, and... James cut him off with a wave of his hand. From now on, you will follow Scott's orders and assist him in managing the building. If you do your job, I'll consider making you the deputy director in the future. Not only will your salary not decrease, but it will also be higher than before. But if you don't listen to Scott, or if you ever begin to act like an arrogant prick again, you're done here. Do we understand each other? Marola nearly collapsed with relief. He felt as if he had survived a disaster. Yeah, yes, sir. Don't worry. From now on, I'll do my best to support Scott. If I do anything to disappoint him, I'll resign myself. James waved his hand at Marola again. Okay. Head back to your office, you'll hear from one of us later. He then turned around and walked toward the elevator with Scott. On the fifth floor of the Orion building, the general manager of Prexness Pharmaceutical, Robert Jeffrey, was working at his desk when somebody barged into his office. He shouted at the newcomers without even raising his head. Get the fuck out! You knock on my door before coming in. James and Scott paid no attention to Jeffrey's outburst. Instead, they just stood there and stared at him with smiles on their faces. Seeing that the rude intruders didn't seem to be moving, Jeffrey raised his head in annoyance. 
He was stunned for a moment, but then a mocking smile appeared on his face in return. Oh, it's you two clowns. So you're regretting your actions now? You want to return to the company to work again? Is that it? Before either of them could speak, Jeffrey looked directly at James. You were a confident little bugger yesterday. Didn't you say you wanted to leave yourself? Now you know you're wrong? Well, sorry, it's too late. James and Scott knew that Mr. Jeffrey's thought was that they came to beg him for their old jobs. Rather than correct him, they remained silent. They wanted to wait until he finished acting like a clueless buffoon before giving him a real shock. Seeing their bitter faces not even daring to say a word, Jeffrey was even more pleased with himself. He put his hands behind his head and leaned back in his chair. If you really want to come back to work, he said, maybe we can work something out. As long as you, I don't know, maybe get me coffee and pick up my dry cleaning for the next few months, perhaps I'll put in a good word with Mr. Evans. After he finished speaking, Jeffrey burst into laughter. He was really having a great time. In fact, he didn't even have the authority to give them their jobs back. Right now, all he wanted to do was humiliate them, then get the security guards to chuck them out. Unfortunately, the scene didn't play out quite as he imagined. Instead, James and Scott looked at him as if they were watching a clown in a circus, amusing the spectators. Then they sat in the chairs opposite his desk and crossed their legs comfortably. James even started whistling. It was as if he were sitting in his own living room. He couldn't have been more relaxed. Scott looked at Jeffrey. All right, tough guy. That's enough of your bullshit. Go ahead. Call Mr. Evans right now. They had come to see the company president, Peter Evans, but he wasn't in the office. They had to make do with Jeffrey. Scott's words were like a slap in the face, instantly making Jeffrey's face turn extremely ugly. But then he started laughing. Ha <laughs> Scott, have you gone fucking crazy after losing your job? You expect to come back to work with that attitude? You guys are dreaming. Now Jeffrey figured that Scott and James had come back to look for trouble because they'd been fired yesterday. Scott's attitude held no pretense of respect. Who told you that we wanted to come back to work? You got it wrong, mister. James and I are here to collect the rent. In fact, hurry up and call Mr. Evans. Tell him that he has ten minutes to get here with a check. If he's not here by then, Prexness can find itself a new corporate office. Jeffrey's mind was becoming a little muddled. You're really here to collect rent? After thinking about it for a moment, he shouted at the two of them. What rent? What are you, Scott, some sort of deranged homeless person now? The rent is none of your business. Who are you trying to scare? Do you think I was born yesterday? He did not believe anything Scott had said. The company had indeed fallen into debt for half of a year. However, in the past, they'd always dealt directly with Mr. Marola. It certainly had nothing to do with Scott Parker. Scott just stared at him, looking almost bored. I don't want to waste my time talking to you anymore. See for yourself. Scott had learned how to handle things from James. He unfolded the deed to the Orion building and showed it to Robert Jeffrey. Episode 37, The Revolt. What? James? Can you see who owns this building now? Scott asked. Robert Jeffrey took the deed and read it carefully. An instant later, his eyes widened like saucers and his mouth hung open. James Tucker was the owner of the entire Orion building. He was worth at least $150 million, for God's sakes. Jeffrey was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe this was real. When he spoke, he even started to stutter. How, how is this possible? How is this possible? Scott shot back. What, do you think we try to fool you with a fake deed? Like this were some kind of game of Monopoly? You're a pathetic fool, Robert. James and I don't have time to argue with you. Scott smiled coldly at Jeffrey. He pointed at the deed and said, You know what a deed looks like. Go on, read the rest of it. Jeffrey wanted to believe it was all a lie, but after hearing what Scott said and seeing the deed, he had no choice but to believe it. For a moment, he didn't know what to say. Thinking of how he had mocked a person worth several million dollars, his face turned red with embarrassment. 
Seeing Jeffrey staring at them in shock, James reminded him of what they'd asked him to do. What are you looking at? Didn't you hear Scott? He asked you to call Peter Evans. Jeffrey didn't dare to meet James's gaze. He lowered his head and picked up the phone to call Evans. He had no choice. As the general manager, he was unable to handle this matter. It was something for the president to handle. Right then, Peter Evans' angry voice could be heard just outside the office. Robert, I asked you yesterday to tidy up the sales report for this month and put it on my desk. Why haven't you brought it over? James and Scott looked at each other and smiled. They'd been doing a lot of smiling since arriving at Prexness Pharmaceutical. What a coincidence, James said. I was looking for you, but you came yourself. Jeffrey's nerves relaxed just a little. These two were here to see Evans, not him. Now that the company president was here, he would naturally take charge of everything. It was not Jeffrey's place to intervene in this matter. He even secretly began laughing inside. Maybe you could scold me, but just wait to see what happens now. Robert, what are you doing? Can't you hear me? Seeing that Jeffrey didn't respond, Evan stepped into the office. The company's performance had been lousy lately, so he was under a lot of pressure. He was not in a good mood. But before Jeffrey could say anything, Evan saw James and Scott sitting in their chairs like they owned the place, looking at him with interest. It's you guys. The company president was stunned for a moment. He just fired them a day ago. Looking at the relaxed expressions on their faces, though, he couldn't figure out what they were here for. And frankly, he didn't care to find out. Robert, call security and have these two thrown out. They had to be dreaming if they wanted to come back to work, he thought. If they were here to ask for their final paychecks, they'd have to wait until the end of the month with the rest of the company's creditors. The budget was already tight. Paying them was out of the question. Despite Evan's order, Jeffrey, who was usually swift and decisive, didn't move a muscle. Evans blew his lid. Robert, are you fucking deaf? Pete, I... I told you to call security and get these two out of here. Jeffrey felt his boss's fury was misdirected. He was about to explain why James and Scott were there when Evan shouted at him again. Why haven't you called security yet? What are you dawdling about? Do you want to get fired too? James and Scott just sat there, leisurely watching the show. The two of them didn't seem to be in any hurry. Besides, they were there to have fun today. Lucky for them, they were presented first-class seats to watch this wonderful live performance. Jeffrey couldn't hold it in anymore. He almost shouted at his boss. Pete, they're here to ask for the rent. Evan's heart jumped when he heard that. He stood rooted in place, thinking furiously. The company indeed owed half a year's rent, but all the money was invested in inventory, so there was no loose cash in the accounts. This was also the reason why Prexness was constantly in debt. Evans knew Prexness Pharmaceutical was a small company, by New York standards. If it couldn't get into the black soon, it wouldn't be able to secure more loans It would face the risk of bankruptcy. At this point, he couldn't afford any trouble at all. Frowning at his general manager, he tried to stall for time. Hmm, these two want rent. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not, Jeffrey said. James showed me the deed just now. This building is under his name. This time, Evan's expression changed drastically. Sure, he had seen James driving a Ferrari when he left the job. He figured it was some gimmick, a rented car or something to impress a date. Now he wasn't so sure. What? Are you telling me he owns this floor? But before he could digest the shock, Jeffrey said, Pete, it's not this floor alone, but the entire building. Evan shook his head, now in complete denial. That's impossible. Absolutely impossible. The deed must be fake. I've had enough of this farce. Call security and kick them out. If it were just this one floor, perhaps Evans would believe it. However, he could never believe that James Tucker owned the entire building. Its lowest valuation was $100 million. Even if James were a secret trust funder, no rich man would casually give something so valuable to his child to play with. He didn't even need to look to confirm that their real estate deed was fake. Not to mention he had just invited Mr. Marola to dinner last month and did everything possible to kiss his ass. 
He definitely wouldn't send anyone, let alone these two idiots, to ask for rent without notice. Evans looked at James and Scott and smiled as if he had seen through their ruse. Seeing his boss's confidence, Jeffrey felt relieved himself. He figured these two guys had come up with this crazy idea in order to somehow ask for the rest of their salaries. They would squeeze money out of the company by mentioning the unpaid rent. He was nearly duped by them. We're done with you two, he said. Just you wait. He picked up his phone, but instead of calling for the security guards, he had a better idea. He dialed another number and stepped out into the hall. James and Scott didn't say a word. They just quietly watched their former bosses perform to their heart's content. Soon, Jeffrey returned with a couple of younger employees. They were big guys. His plan was obvious. He was going to have them beat up James and Scott. Sure enough, Jeffrey pointed at them and yelled, Kick their rude asses and then throw them out. Unfortunately, his fantasy of seeing his employees rushing over and beating the shit out of James and Scott didn't play out the way he expected. James, Scott, why are you guys here? Almost at the moment Jeffrey finished speaking, the two young men ran over to their former co-workers and greeted them warmly. They had been present at the expensive dinner last night. There was no way they were going to lay a hand on James or Scott. The two young men were naturally excited to see them again. They even asked if they wanted some coffee. Practically laughing now, James and Scott gratefully accepted the offer. Jeffrey thought he was losing his mind. What are you guys doing? Didn't you get what I said? He was furious that his employees had disregarded him so blatantly. Evans was even more angry. Not only had these employees practically ignored his presence there in the office, they actually acted like James and Scott were a couple of rock stars. Jeffrey looked on all of this in horror. If it continued, he was afraid he would lose his job today. The two guys he'd brought in to beat some respect into James and Scott instead were playing patty cake with them. Damn it, don't you two want to work here anymore? He yelled, but they barely paid attention to him. Evans could no longer stay calm either. Ever since he had become president of the company, he had never been slapped in the face like this. Through gritted teeth, he warned, If you don't listen to the general manager, don't think I will not fire you both right here and now. But his words had the opposite effect. They looked at Evans, and one of them said, I don't believe you. You think your shit don't stink just because you're the boss? We're not doing it. Got it? They then both resigned on the spot. Peter Evans was out of his mind in anger. He felt he couldn't even control his employees anymore. Episode 38, The Resolution Peter Evans never expected such a thing to happen. The situation had gotten completely out of control. Robert Jeffrey took a step back and stood to the side, keeping his mouth shut. James and Scott didn't say a word from beginning to end. They just quietly watched everything unfold, trying their best to hold back their laughter. Yet this wasn't the worst part for the two executives. Sensing the commotion in the general manager's office, the whole company was curious. Soon all the employees had gathered outside the door to see what was going on. They'd heard everything. They had all gone to James's dinner last night. Naturally, they were predisposed to favor him over Mr. Evans. He was usually very stingy and strict with the employees, and they had long been dissatisfied with him. Therefore, after they heard their two co-workers resign, the employees outside the door said that they wanted to resign as well. Now the entire company was out of control. Jeffrey was so scared that he retreated to the corner of the office. Evans just stood there stunned. But Peter Evans was no pushover. Although his employees were making him miserable, he was infuriated when he saw the complacent smile on James's face. Then he remembered. He had a good relationship with Thomas Marola. Right! He could ask Tom to bring the security guards to escort James and Scott from the building. He knew now that these two guys were a disaster. If he did not throw them out, who knows how much worse it would get. Even at this point, Evans didn't believe that James's deed was real. The thought was simply too absurd. He had placed all his hopes on Marola. He quickly took out his phone and dialed Marola's number. Hello, Tom. Would you please bring some guards up to my floor? Someone is causing trouble in my company. 
When James and Scott heard what he said, they were further amused. They knew that Evans was going to ask for help, but they didn't think he would call Marola. This show had just taken an exciting new turn. Since all the employees had quit their jobs collectively, the entire place was in an uproar. James stood up from his chair and waved his hand to get everyone's attention. All the employees instantly quieted down. Witnessing this spectacle, Evans was humiliated. He really didn't expect this. As the alleged boss here, he had lost all dignity. He snorted and said, Enjoy the attention while you can, you two. Once Mr. Marola comes up, the party will be over. James didn't say anything. He was actually very curious. What was Evans going to do when he saw Marola respectfully greeting him and calling him boss? As if on cue, Marola and about a half a dozen security guards burst onto the floor and headed for the office. When Evans saw that Marola had brought so many people, it was as if he had seen his savior. He pushed his way through the gathered employees and said warmly, Tom, thanks for coming. It's them. I want their asses out of here now. Oddly, Marola didn't even glance at Evans. He walked right past him and over to James. I'm sorry, sir. Is this gentleman disturbing you? He asked, pointing at Evans. Evans froze on the spot. When he heard what Marola said, his face turned deathly pale. What? Tom, is this a joke? Although he still had doubts in his heart, an ominous feeling overcame Evans' body. It was becoming more and more likely that James's deed for the Orion building was real. This was the first time that Marola would be able to display his ability to handle a crisis in front of James. How could he pass up such a good opportunity? Without any warning, Marola rushed up to Evans and grabbed his arm, ready to hustle him out of the building. Evans was absolutely stunned, but then he roared, Tom, have you gone insane? You should be evicting them, not me. Ignoring him, Marola ordered the security guards into action. Help me remove this man from the premises. The gathered employees looked on in shock. Although they had enjoyed James's expensive dinner the night before, they had never imagined that he was the owner of this place. Seeing that the security guards were ready to manhandle Evans out of the building, James stopped them. All right, that's enough. I'm here to collect rent today, and I can't do that if Mr. Evans is out on the streets. The guards unhanded Evans. James walked up to him and narrowed his eyes. I really am here to collect the rent, because I really do own this building. Why do you have to make things so complicated? Evans could not hide the shock in his eyes. He had never thought that this ordinary employee who used to work under him would be a super boss in disguise. Evans did his best to regain face by placating James miserably. I was wrong. I was wrong. The company's finances are in trouble and we can't afford the rent. Can you give me a few days? Evans was pathetic. He was like a pitiful worm. There was absolutely no dignity in his actions. James just looked at his former boss and started berating him. You're asking me to give you a way out? Then why didn't you think of being so accommodating to Scott and me before? Why didn't you leave a way out for us? James was a decent man, but he was not a saint. He just waved his hand. You brought this upon yourself. I won't waste my time with you any longer. Starting now... I am in charge of your company. Without waiting for Evans to respond, James pointed at him and Jeffrey, who was hiding in the corner. Mr. Marola, please throw him and the guy hiding in the corner out. Without ceremony, Evans and Jeffrey were hustled out of the building by the guards. All the employees were happy to see them go. James asked his former colleague, Mila McGarian, to take charge of the company. After spending a few hours arranging everything, he finally left the Orion building. It was still relatively early, so he drove straight to the next check-in location, Perkins Pier. He was very curious about what the next reward would be. The Hudson River ran alongside the western shore of Manhattan like a sword. It was an important channel that connected the borough to New Jersey and points west before emptying into New York Harbor. Therefore, the number of ships sailing in and out of the river was significant. Perkins Pier was one of the biggest docks in New York. Although it was almost noon when James arrived at the pier, 
The place was still bustling with activity. The rumbling cranes and shouts of the longshoremen created a lively scene. James found a place to park his car and started walking toward the dock. His curiosity was getting more intense the longer he walked. About ten minutes later, he arrived at the pier. It was very big. He was planning to look around, but unexpectedly, a notification sounded in his mind. The check-in had been a success. Episode 39 a luxurious reward. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a luxury yacht. James couldn't believe what he just heard. Damn, no wonder I was given an A1F license. Looked like the system was setting it all up. He just stood there shaking his head. Dear God, this global check-in system is something else. As he was reveling in the joy of yet another incredible turn of events... The system's notification sounded once again in his mind. The relevant information will be delivered by the professional staff of the yacht company within 10 minutes. Host, please do not leave Perkins Pier for the time being. Next check-in location, Sultan Park, the Maldives. James' head was spinning. The Maldives? Sultan Park? Holy shit, this is too awesome. He had just obtained a luxury yacht. Now the next check-in location was in the Maldives. It was a perfect match. The Maldives had always been a dream trip for James, but he barely had the means to leave New York for a weekend getaway, let alone afford a trip to an exclusive destination in the Indian Ocean. But now not only could he travel to the Maldives, he could do so on his own yacht. This, James felt, may be the best day of his life. He thought back about the photos one of his friends had posted online when she went to the Maldives on vacation a few years ago. The azure sky, the turquoise sea, the silver beach, the private cabanas and boardwalks extending into the sea. It all seemed so perfect, yet completely out of reach. When he saw his friend having the time of her life, he couldn't help but envy her. And then he got the global check-in system. Here again, he was presented with another chance to wipe away his regrets and fulfill his desires of the past. The system had changed his life so drastically that he could barely believe it even now. James closed his eyes and took a deep breath. In his mind, he was recalling the photos he had seen. He imagined himself lying on the sandy beach under the warm sun with a cocktail in his hand. He could even see the little umbrella and wedges of fresh fruit sticking out of the top of his glass. Sir, sir! A voice interrupted James' fantasy, forcing him back to reality. He opened his eyes and saw a man in his 40s dressed in a crisp white nautical uniform. James looked around. There was no one else nearby. The guy was obviously addressing him. He pointed at himself. Me? The man came closer and asked, Are you Mr. James Tucker? By this point, James could guess the man's identity, but he asked anyway, just in case. Um, yes, that's me. And who are you? Hello, Mr. Tucker. My name is Stephen Leland. I work for East Ocean Maritime here in New York. I have here all the information you'll need for the yacht you've ordered. Leland held out a delicate leather bag. James took note of the bag. It was Chanel. He wasn't at all surprised the system had never done anything that wasn't first class all the way. He took the bag and opened it casually. After confirming that everything appeared to be in order, he held it out to Leland and said, Thank you, Mr. Leland. You can put this on the yacht and I will read it later. Leland took the bag and looked at James curiously. Sir, aren't you going to take a closer look? In the past, whenever he delivered documents for a new yacht, it would take others at least half a day to go through all the information they needed to know about their purchase. And that was for an ordinary yacht. This time, he was delivering a premier vessel worth many millions of dollars, yet James Tucker took less than a minute to finish checking the data. As an employee of East Ocean Maritime, it was Leland's responsibility to ensure the client felt that everything was in order. Otherwise, if something went wrong, he would be blamed for the screw-up. But this client seemed unconcerned. No need, James said. I trust your company completely. Although James now had the benefit of a photographic memory, the files contained a significant amount of legal and technical details. 
he would need more time to read and digest all of it. Steve Leland didn't seem phased at all. Of course, sir, he said, taking the bag and tucking it under his arm. Still, there was a hint of relief in his eyes. Leland dealt with the super-rich all the time and was used to their expectations, demands, and idiosyncrasies. When delivering yachts to typical clients, he would often have to field all kinds of questions. Inevitably, they felt it was his fault when they couldn't understand a single thing he'd said. This James Tucker, on the other hand, not only spoke in a friendly manner, but he also seemed casually confident about the impressive boat he was about to take possession of. Leland felt good about this customer for a change. He extended his hand toward the dock and said, Well then, Mr. Tucker, please follow me. James followed Leland down a walkway and passed an enormous port crane boom. When they rounded a corner toward the waterfront, he stopped dead in his tracks. There in front of him was a stunning 130-foot-long luxury ocean-going yacht. Leland pointed at the vessel docked at the pier and said, Mr. Tucker, this is the yacht you ordered. It will be my pleasure to go over the entire craft with you in detail. James was still a little dazed. Okay, was all he could muster. With Leland in the lead, the men walked up the gangway and boarded the ship. As they walked along the starboard side toward the aft deck, Leland proceeded with his professional introduction. Mr. Tucker, according to your custom requirements, my company has provided you with an Explorer-class vessel capable of long-distance voyages in every sort of nautical environment. James was thrilled with what he was seeing. Among all luxury yachts, Explorer-class vessels were perfect for sailing in everything from placid tropical seas to extreme polar oceans. They were the best of the best. The presentation continued. Leland briefly described the state-of-the-art bridge, the helicopter pad, and the space below decks for the ship-to-shore tender. It's not only appointed to the highest luxury standards, Leland said. It also has the ability to sail through tropical storms, break through Arctic ice, and perform self-rescues at sea. It has a full complement of special functions that can satisfy all your exploration needs, Mr. Tucker. James could see the Explorer designation wasn't just for show. He would have no problem taking this boat through the Caribbean, around the Cape Hope, or to the North Pole if he wished. Its construction and details were completely different from an ordinary luxury yacht. James did his best to suppress his giddy excitement. Since moving to New York, he had barely traveled farther than the Catskills. Now, the entire planet was his to explore. Seeing James nod, Leland continued the presentation. East Ocean Maritime maintains marina and shipyard offices in many of locations around the world. We can provide you with complete service and maintenance needs at all times during your voyage. To thank you for the extraordinary order, our company has complimented you with a suite of special services, including docking assistant at foreign ports and visa processing for you and your companions as needed. We're delighted to serve you and we'll do our best to meet your needs in the future. They stood on the aft deck, James taking in the sight of the beautiful ship that now belonged to him. Thank you, Mr. Leland. Let's go up on the bridge and take a look. Yes, sir. Please come with me. He led James to a hydraulic platform at the back of the ship. Leland took out a remote control and pressed a button. The platform slowly began to rise. Soon the two of them arrived at the top deck. Episode 40. Can you guess who this is? Today's weather was good. James stood at the edge of the deck and gazed into the distance. From the pier on the Hudson, the Manhattan skyline rose behind him. To his front, he could see the Palisades on the Jersey side of the river. The water created a steady rhythmic beat as it lapped against the hull. The blue sky stretched to the horizon like a blanket. A few seagulls flapped their wings and circled. From time to time, they let out a few squawks, adding to the picture-perfect nautical atmosphere. Taking time to absorb the peaceful moment, James felt as if he had stepped into a dream. The sea breeze coming from the harbor in the Atlantic Ocean beyond blew against his face. He opened his arms and let the wind sweep over him, as if he were embracing the magnificent scene before him. This new feeling already was a comfortable fit for him. 
He believed this kind of life would become his new normal, filling him with indescribable excitement. The layout of the second deck was exquisite. James admired the advanced cockpit, and behind it the living room, the entertainment and leisure area, and the bedrooms behind elegant doors. There was a dedicated observatory with a high-end telescope for stargazing, and a smaller one for looking out to sea. A state-of-the-art galley, and equipment for every conceivable water activity. According to Leland, below decks there was a fully stocked pantry to store fresh water and all kinds of food. There was even a wine cellar. The decor was gorgeous. The word luxurious didn't do it justice. It was truly a work of art, a luxury apartment at sea. Leland led James into the cockpit. This is the control room of the yacht. It comes fully equipped with GPS, sonar, global nautical charts, a satellite and auxiliary high-frequency phone, AIS location tracking system, and so on. Everything is here to meet all of your needs for ocean exploration. James touched the wheeled helm of the yacht, barely listening to Leland's spiel. Thanks to his earlier reward, he already had far more sailing skill than Leland. Although the man's explanation was adequate, it was still far below his own evaluation of the yacht's systems and capabilities. James looked at the array of screens in front of him. With all the electronic surveillance equipment aboard, he could monitor every corner of the yacht at a glance, in every weather and ocean condition imaginable. In other words, the entire yacht was fully equipped and ready to sail. Leland cleared his throat, feeling a little parched after the lengthy presentation. Mr. Tucker, that concludes my overview of the features and functions of the yacht. Do you have any questions? James looked at him and smiled. Thank you for your hard work, Mr. Leland. I have only one. Leland was happy to oblige after the respectful treatment he'd received from this unusual client. Please, just ask. My job is to ensure you are completely comfortable with your purchase. I heard that the docking fee for a yacht of this size is quite expensive, James said. How high is it exactly? Leland didn't hesitate. Don't worry, Mr. Tucker, my company has a long-running relationship with Perkins Pier, so docking fees are compliments of East Ocean Maritime. It is our special service to you as a VIP customer. James couldn't help feeling a sense of relief. As an A1F certified captain, he knew that a 40-meter super yacht like this would cost many thousands a day to dock in the port of New York City. Although he was hardly short of money, it was not a small expense. Thank you for your generosity and your thoroughness. I think we're done here. Leland handed the Chanel document bag to James. Yes, sir. Here's your information and the keys for the hatches. Please enjoy it. James suddenly stretched his hand and called out. Oh, one more thing. Is there something else, Mr. Tucker? Leland asked. Yes. Can I get your number? If I have any questions in the future, I can just send you a message. Of course, Leland replied. My apologies for the oversight. He opened his phone and provided his number. James added Leland to his contact list. The first thing he did was transfer a $5,000 gratuity to him. Thank you again for your hard work today. I sent you a small token of my appreciation. Sir, this is my job, Leland said. As long as you are satisfied with my service, then I'm happy as well. There really is no need for a tip. James was undeterred. Just treat it as acknowledgement of a job well done. Leland wanted to protest more, but he sensed James's sincerity and relented. He opened the app on his phone and clicked on accept. When he saw the $5,000, his eyes widened just a touch. He was accustomed to large amounts of money in his world, but still, it was a generous tip. Leland simply acknowledged the gratuity with a grateful nod before turning around and disembarking off the yacht. James was finally alone on his boat. Given the sunny weather and calm waters, he felt that he should bring the vessel out into the Atlantic for a shakedown cruise. It was the perfect opportunity to test all of its systems. Although his theoretical knowledge was at master level, James knew he needed hands-on experience at sea, especially if he was going to sail all the way to the Maldives. James brought the document back to the upper bridge. Just as he was about to start the engine, his phone rang. 
Noticing an unfamiliar number, he didn't plan to pick it up. He went to put the phone on the seat, but his finger accidentally swept across the screen and the call connected. A sweet voice came from the speaker. Mr. James Tucker, can you guess who this is? James was momentarily stunned before a smile bloomed on his face. He picked up the phone and said, I would never forget your voice, Vanessa. Ha <laughs> ha, you're no fun at all, Vanessa said flirtatiously. I was hoping you would have to guess. James smiled. How did you get my number? Did you do something to me that night in my sleep? Vanessa laughed. You wish. It was too easy for me to get your number. Remember your VIP card at the Atlanta Grill? You were the dummy who provided it. Of course, James remembered. Mr. Jenkins had asked for his number when he signed him up for the card. It must have been Vanessa's idea. He complimented her for her smarts. <laughs> That's clever. I thought it was weird when Mr. Jenkins asked for it, but I didn't expect you to be the one behind it. Quite resourceful. That's right, she said. Then her tone changed and she lowered her voice. Where are you now? I'm not in a good mood. Can you come and have a drink with me? Vanessa, what's wrong? He asked. When she didn't reply, he quickly said, I'm at Perkins Pier over on the west side. Grab a cab or whatever and come over. The weather is perfect today. I will take you out on the sea. Episode 41. Wine. Vanessa's interest was piqued. What? How are we going to get out to sea? James chuckled mysteriously. <laughs> Never mind that. Are you coming or not? I'm about to leave. Do you have wine? I have enough wine for you to take a bath. Just come over. Now that's interesting. I'm on my way. Vanessa hung up. In the cockpit, James put down his phone and muttered to himself, I thought I'd never see that girl again. While enjoying the impressive New York skyline, he stretched lazily on the couch in the saloon. He reflected on how much his life had changed since he had the global check-in system. Not only had he received phenomenally generous rewards, even his luck seemed to be getting better and better. He relished his wonderful mood, relaxing on his new yacht, gazing at the sky, and waiting for a beautiful woman to arrive. His relaxation turned to drowsiness, and James fell into a contented sleep. You are my little apple. No matter how much I love you, it is not enough. About an hour later, he was woken up by his phone's blaring ringtone. Hello, James, Vanessa's sweet voice sounded. I'm here. Where are you? James gave her directions to his mooring while climbing onto the deck. Soon, he saw her graceful figure on the pier. When Vanessa saw James on the yacht, she waved happily. She was dressed more casually this time. Although it was a simple purple dress, it couldn't cover up her gorgeous figure. She seemed to be excited running toward the yacht. Her long black hair danced in the wind. To James, she looked like a fairy out of a storybook. He was completely mesmerized by her. James met her at the gangway as she boarded. When did you get such a big yacht? Her face was full of wonder. James practically melted on the spot. He smiled brightly and ignored her question. Instead, he pointed downriver toward the harbor and said, Nothing beats a bad mood better than some ocean air. How about it? Vanessa no longer bothered to ask how he got the yacht. She just patted him on the shoulder and said, Let's go. James led her to the bridge and started the yacht. With the precision of an experienced seaman, he piloted it away from its mooring and slowly down the Hudson River toward the sea. Vanessa was as joyful as a child who'd just gotten a new toy. James sensed he was making more of an impression on her. He could see it in her eyes. Vanessa was a rich girl, and she was not unfamiliar with yachts. But there weren't many men even in her world who not only owned such a luxurious vessel, but could control it. As the boat slowly motored past Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, Vanessa said, James... You are amazing. You even know how to pilot a yacht. He nodded modestly. 
I'm somewhat new at it, but I'm still better than most. Oh, great. What level of license do you have? James suspected Vanessa was just curious, nothing more. I spend my free time learning different things. Not long ago, I barely managed to get an A1F license. Wow, that's the highest level. I went for my license too, but I only got the A2F. You're awesome. Vanessa gazed at James with newfound admiration. She realized that this strange man she had met only a few days ago was unusually capable and charming. <laughs> That's not all I'm awesome at, James said with a naughty smile. Vanessa just blushed. You're so bad. Not wanting the atmosphere to turn awkward, James quickly changed the subject. Want to give the helm a try? Although it was James's first time at the helm of a yacht himself, he felt he was skilled enough to help Vanessa take the controls. Can I? She asked. Of course you can. James took Vanessa's soft hand and gently pulled her in front of him. It was as if he was hugging her from behind. Vanessa began breathing just a little harder. Although she was feeling shy, she had no intention of breaking free from James's embrace. Soon she forgot her embarrassment and was feeling wonderful. She felt like an excited teenager experiencing her first love. She was a bundle of emotions her heart pounding in her chest. The yacht soon left the confines of New York Harbor and reached the vast openness of the Atlantic Ocean. James immediately set the controls to automatic pilot, then said, come on, I'll take you to the top deck to enjoy the wind. Vanessa just nodded. She felt like she was falling hard for James. On the upper deck, James turned quickly and asked, all right, what do you want to drink? But his sudden action made Vanessa, who was following close behind him, walked straight into his arms. She was clearly a little flustered by the moment. She took a step back and skirted James quickly walking toward the deck. Um, anything's fine, she replied. James was amused. Vanessa was acting like a shy schoolgirl running away from her flirty boyfriend. He went down to the cellar and selected a bottle of red wine. He arrived back on deck with the bottle, two glasses, and a corkscrew. Vanessa was looking out to see through the smaller telescope on the observation platform. James walked over to the sofas and chairs in the observatory. He opened the bottle, poured two glasses, and held one out to Vanessa. Come over and have some wine with me. You are too beautiful to be in a bad mood. Vanessa walked over to the sitting area, took the glass from James, and threw a sweet smile at him. James Tucker, you sound like some sleazy guy on the make in a bar. She was teasing, though. To Vanessa, James was like a refreshing spring breeze. He gave her a warm feeling ever since they'd met at the Atlantic Grill. She felt all of her concern slipping away. He just laughed. Sure, I may be on the make, but I'm telling the truth. Vanessa just raised her wine glass. Come, James, cheers. Then clinked it with his. She drank it all in one big swig. James was a little surprised by her action, but he followed suit and drank his all in one gulp as well. Vanessa handed him the empty glass. Come on, fill it up. She's been around, he thought. She knows better. Wine needs to be relished slowly, but obviously she just wants to get drunk. James was concerned, but he kept his questions to himself and poured her some more wine. She downed the second glass. Another refill empty. Vanessa drank three whole glasses of wine without pause. James was disturbed by her behavior, but he didn't stop her. It wasn't his place. Vanessa was a sophisticated woman who obviously had something weighing on her mind. She would have to sort it out in her own way. James just stayed by her side. If she wanted to discuss it with him, he was willing to listen, but it was her choice. He would not put any more pressure on Vanessa Harrison. Episode 42. Everything depends on the timing. After drinking three glasses of wine, Vanessa finally started feeling tipsy. Suddenly, she began to cry. James didn't say anything. He gently wrapped his arms around her waist and pulled her into his embrace. He just let her vent her emotions without having to explain herself. Vanessa cried for more than ten minutes before she gradually calmed down. She looked at James with slightly swollen eyes and said, 
I'm sorry. I lost my composure. He tried to lighten the mood. Don't be silly. Your eyes are beautiful even when they're red and puffy. Vanessa smiled through her tears. She felt warm and safe with him. Vanessa gently removed herself from his embrace. She walked over to the edge of the deck and leaned on the top rail, blinking her eyes in the ocean breeze. Aren't you curious about what happened to me at the Atlantic Grill that night? She asked. It was her way of taking control of the conversation in their budding relationship. Vanessa felt that James was hard to figure out. He had never been emotional in front of her, always remaining calm. And now here she was with him on this luxury yacht. The mystery surrounding him intrigued her. She found it hard to get him off her mind, which was also why she thought of him when she was feeling down. But one thing about him baffled her the most. Why was he not more curious about her? A beautiful young woman who threw herself into his arms that evening at the restaurant. James was pleased by the question and responded with one of his own. Why should I be curious about you? In fact, he had been eager to learn more about Vanessa ever since they met in such a dramatic way. He just didn't want to seem too eager to this wealthy, sophisticated woman. Things needed to take their natural course. If he acted too needy, it would only backfire on him. All of this required appropriate timing, and now James felt the timing was right. He let her continue to talk. James, you are really strange, you know? A hot woman suddenly appears in front of you, throws herself into your arms, and forces a kiss on you. You should at least be interested in her reasons, her story. Vanessa was used to men being attracted to her. It was common for her to be approached in bars, restaurants, shops, even on the streets of New York. That was a fact. However, the man in front of her, while complimentary and nice, didn't seem to have the slightest bit of curiosity about her background or experiences. This aroused her curiosity instead. When James saw Vanessa's interest in him, he knew he had successfully turned the tables. He had been waiting for this moment. It was finally his time to move a piece in their little game. He did not answer Vanessa's question directly. Instead, he looked at her and said, Let me tell you a story. Where I grew up, there were bunches of blackberry bushes. They were everywhere in the mountains. In late summer, the hillside would become a children's paradise because the delicious berries would be ripening. But as you know, children are impatient. They usually didn't wait for the berries to mature. They were always in a hurry to pick the blackberries and eat them. But blackberry bushes have sharp thorns, and in their haste, rather than enjoying the berries, many children were injured by the thorns. But there was one child who never rushed to reach in and pick the berries, knowing he'd be jabbed by the thorns. He knew that once the fruit matured, he only need to gently shake the bush and the berries would fall off on their own. That child was me. James finished speaking and looked meaningfully at Vanessa. He noticed that her gaze had changed from curiosity to admiration. She obviously understood the meaning of his story. James paused for a moment. He stared at her and said, Vanessa, anyone, and I mean anyone, would be curious about you, including me. But picking the fruit depends on the right timing. If the timing is wrong, you get hurt. Today I feel that the time to pluck the fruit has arrived. James's story touched Vanessa deeply. She knew that this man was really different from the spoiled rich playboys who'd hovered around her all of her life. Now it's your turn, Vanessa. You can tell me anything. Tell me why you're unhappy. I'll keep my mouth shut and just listen. Vanessa was smitten. Not only was he talented and wealthy, he was also charismatic and mysterious. He gave her a sense of security she had never even felt before. Her curiosity had blossomed into adoration, maybe even love. Vanessa completely pulled down all her defenses. She walked over and hugged James. She was worried that if she did not embrace him tight enough, this man would leave her. Finally, she looked up at him. Let's toast again to this moment. Vanessa left his embrace and poured another glass of wine. She sat on the sofa and gestured for James to sit beside her, looking like a proper young lady from a good family. Her mannerisms were understated and elegant. James came over and took a seat next to her. 
This time, Vanessa did not finish the wine in one gulp. Instead, she gracefully took a sip before putting the glass down. It was obvious that after venting her emotions, she had regained her usual poise. What do you think true happiness is? She asked. That depends on how you define happiness, he responded. For a homeless person to be given a $20 bill could be his moment of happiness. For a fisherman when he returns from sea with a full load, that might be his moment. For a businessman, it could be when he obtains his first fortune. For an ordinary loafer like me, being able to spend time with a beauty like you is the moment of my true happiness. James smiled when he had said it. Vanessa was deeply charmed. Mr. James Tucker, you really know how to make me happy. Yet Vanessa barely squeezed out a smile. Looking sad, she began to tell her story. My mother passed away when I was three years old, leaving me and my father alone. My father adored my mother. After she died, he showered all his love for her on me. Dad has doted on me since I was young. I was like his precious treasure. He never married again. He thought it might upset me. He raised me by himself. He's a wonderful man, really. Yeah, he was busy with his career, but he never neglected me. Over the year, my father's business expanded. He eventually grew his company into one of the top-listed firms in New York. I became a child of privilege. My friends, my relatives, almost everyone who knows me thinks I am the happiest person in the world. They envy me for living what appears to be a carefree life. They envy me for having such a rich father. But nobody knows how I feel about it. That this is not the life I want. I will never diss my father. He has always taken care of me and I will always be grateful. But he has pre-planned almost everything in my life. He has raised me to be like a bird in a cage, safe from the world, but never free. Whenever I try to explain this to people, they don't get it. They figure I should be content. But I don't like this arranged fate, this life without any challenges. Vanessa stopped for a moment and gazed out to sea. Then she continued, but I'm a wimp. I was always an obedient girl, sensible people said. I never resisted or disobeyed my dad. He sacrificed so much for me and I'm his only family in this world. I wouldn't do anything to hurt him. But for about a year now, dad has been trying to set me up with the son of one of his friends at the tennis club. His name is Todd. She laughed a little, thinking about it. There's no doubt this guy is outstanding on paper. He's 25 and has studied abroad. He was a top student at Harvard, graduating with a BA in economics. His family is serious old money. He and his siblings will eventually inherit tens of billions of dollars, and believe it or not, he's actually a decent guy. In his previous life, James would have been stricken with jealousy by her description of this Todd. Now sitting on his multi-million dollar super yacht with a raft of lucrative Manhattan properties in his portfolio, he felt no such anger. As promised, he just kept listening. You'd think I would be captivated by him, right? Vanessa continued. He's like the quintessential perfect catch. My father certainly thinks so. He thinks that if I marry Todd, I'll be set for life. But I have no feelings for him at all. Zero. None. The first time we met, there was nothing there. At least for me, there wasn't. There's no way I could marry him. I tried to explain this to my father, but he wouldn't listen. I never expected him to be so stubborn about it. He thought I'd learned to love Todd in time. He basically totally disregarded my feelings and wishes. Here's the real kicker. Just a few days ago, my dad actually made a private agreement with Todd's family to hold an engagement party without my knowledge. Apparently, Todd was going to propose to me in public. I guess they figured I wouldn't be able to resist the social pressure and would accept. Fortunately, my chatty cousin let the cat out of the bag and I split. That was the night I met you. The people chasing me were my family's bodyguards. She chuckled again, but it had a sad ring to it. I ruined the engagement party. Todd and his family were humiliated. My father naturally is angry and has stopped speaking to me. My relationship with him has gone cold. It's weird, though. He's my father. I love him, and I'm crushed that he's so unhappy. 
On the other hand, I am deliriously happy that I finally found my freedom. So as you can see, it's complicated. The current me is unable to recognize myself. I can't see my future. By this point, Vanessa had tears streaming down her face. She took a sip of the wine and looked up at the sky. James continued his silence, knowing that any unnecessary words of comfort would appear forced and meaningless. It was a revealing story for him. He had always yearned for the life of the wealthy. He had once wished he were a rich trust fund baby like some of the guys and girls he knew in college. But now it wasn't so clear to him. It seemed that while the poor have always had their troubles, the rich had troubles of their own. Money did not guarantee happiness. That point was crystal clear to him from her story. Although James was a conflicted mess on the inside as he sorted through all she just told him, his composure was still as calm as a serene lake. There was not the slightest ripple of emotion on his face. Vanessa forced a smile and looked at him. Well, James, I imagine you've guessed my identity by now. That's right, I'm the only daughter of David Arison, the chairman of Beta International in New York. I'm really sorry for dumping all of this on you. I hope you don't mind me talking so much. James looked at her sincerely. Why would I mind? I'm honored that you trust me so much, and I'm very happy I understand you better now. Vanessa gave him a relieved smile. You actually feel honored? The way she looked at James, it was obvious she considered him a dear friend. No, it was something more than a friend. That's right. Believe me, countless guys can only dream of hearing the inner thoughts of someone like you. I guess I'm just the lucky one. His sincerity touched Vanessa's heart and made her completely drop the last of her defenses. The two of them sat on the deck and sipped another glass of wine, gazing at the sky together. They silently stared at the beautiful blue sky and white clouds stretching above the sea to the horizon. Vanessa rested her head on James' shoulder. The breeze blew through her long hair. It also stirred something deep inside her. She looked up at him. Fate is so strange, yet it can be so wonderful. I didn't even know you that well, but now I don't think that I could ever leave you.